Ross Kagan, Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Embracing complexity, a drosophila approach to personalized medicine. So the, first of all, thank you very much. This is really an amazing uh, day. I'm actually taking notes and I'm probably gonna try to copy this back in the States. So I'm the fly guy. I'm introduced in the last session. We're gonna have a lot of amazing talks. And uh, in the spirit of those, I'm gonna try to keep my talk focused to one disease, my lab studies, diabetes, rare genetic diseases, but also cancer, and that seems like a good one to focus on. So here's my outline. I'm gonna talk about complexity, and if I had to give a different name to my talk, it would be embracing complexity. And I'm gonna talk about, at the end, an unusual fly-to-bedside clinical trial that sort of gathers up a variety of things that we've learned. So let's think about cancer. It's one of the most anciently described diseases. 5,000 years ago, in Egyptian cuneiform, uh, discussions, they talked about uh, six uh, breast cancer patients and the frustrations they had at treating them. So since that time, we've had at least four, and with immune therapy, probably five revolutions in cancer therapy. The first one is surgery, which works beautifully uh, if you get all the tumor out. But of course, the problem is metastasis. When cells leave the mothership, you can get yourself in trouble. And so more recently, we moved to DNA damaging agents, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, uh, which also works well, but again, it's very toxic, and uh, tumors very often become um, uh, resistant to it, but it is still probably the most common uh, and successful standard of care along with uh, uh, surgery. In more recent years, we have moved to uh, rational drug discovery, and even more recently to what we call personalized, which has really evolved into precision medicine. And the idea here is that you understand the drivers of the disease, and then you drug those with some precision. So how are we doing? So here's the summary of clinical trials, success rates for cancer. In fact, cancer is, among major diseases, it has the lowest success rate. About 7% of drugs that go into clinical trials succeed, despite passing through many of our models. Furthermore, with precision medicine, which I think has a lot of promise and will hopefully uh, improve that, and I'm uh, contrasting that with uh, personalized medicine, which I'll get to, it is also both surprisingly more toxic uh, than chemotherapy, which is hard to do, and also resistance seems to emerge even more readily. So for example, in a very well-studied case, abrafenib, which targets BRAF in, um, in, in myeloma patients, while we get tremendous uh, response by 40% of the patients, and you can see an example here of the tumors going away, in a few weeks, in just a few weeks more, almost all patients relapse, and then we're left with the same problem, okay? So my purpose here is not to be negative. Uh, cancer has been somewhat frustrating, but I think there's a lot of interesting things that we're gonna hear about today, uh, and I'm gonna share with you some of the work that my laboratory has done with that as well. And I, uh, one uh, image I wanna bring out that I think is appropriate to this meeting is the candle problem. So the problem here is how to light this candle and get it to not drip on the table or the floor using just a box of tacks and a box of matches. I'm sure everybody here has figured it out. And of course, the solution here is to literally think outside the box. And so what, I'm, what I think we're hearing today is efforts to really get away from the standard ways of thinking about cancer, diabetes, and so on, and trying to move out of that box to think about other ways that aren't just the same approaches. So on that point, uh, my laboratory has studied a number of cancers, uh, thyroid, pancreatic, lung, breast, and colorectal, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of them here. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with medullary thyroid carcinoma, which I wasn't when we started, um, you just need to know two things uh, for my talk. One, it's one of the few thyroid tumor types that can actually be lethal, uh, because by the time you discover it, cells have often left the thyroid. And two, the majority of patients in the subtype we study have activations in the RET receptor tyrosine kinase. And here's a high-resolution crystal graphic structure of RET. It binds ligands such as GDNF, it dimerizes with a cofactor, and it activates a variety of signaling pathways, which my laboratory and many others have studied. So how do you model thyroid cancer in flies? Which, to be fair, they don't really have a thyroid. They have a very skinny neck. So we put the mutations um, into uh, RET that you see in humans and targeted them not to the neck, but to the eye. And I hope you can see here, compared to a normal eye with a nice smooth terrain, 
that when you put oncogenic ret in, you get tumors actually growing out of the eye. And what you can't see here, but if you were to look underneath, is cells are actually leaving the eye field and going to distant sites around the fly, growing up secondary tumors and killing the fly. So we've used this to study uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma, but that's really not the purpose of disease studies, it's to try to identify therapeutic. So long story short, Marcus Vidal, a former postdoc in my lab, uh, and others uh, in the lab developed a system for growing flies in a 96 well plate format. We move food and drug into each well. We move 10 embryos into each well. We put an oxygen permeable lid on top. The flies hatch out, they eat the food, they eat the drug, and we just screen for drugs that work, and then work backwards to figure out why they work. So in our first iteration of this, we identified a compound originally called ZD6474, and along with important work from Massimo Santoro, we worked with uh, Sam Wells and AstraZeneca to move this compound into drug trials, and long story short, it was approved in 2011 as the first standard of care for medullary thyroid carcinoma, and I've met a number of patients who have taken this drug. So what have we learned from this? besides the fact that you can take simple model organisms and use them to identify useful therapeutics. Well, what is vandetinib, which is its commercial name now, what does vandetinib do? Is it a ret inhibitor? And the answer is not really. Here is a kinase wheel, and the red dots show you all the different kinases that vandetinib hits. And if you're not sure which one is red, I'm not sure either. It's the world's dirtiest uh, drug, and yet it, it succeeded where others failed. And what we learned from this is that two things. One, that dirty drugs, imprecision drugs, can be useful. And two, sometimes targeting the driver of the disease is not the best way of going about things. So knowing what drives the disease doesn't always give you the therapeutic. So one approach that my laboratory is taking is building new drugs. And we're working with uh, uh, medicinal chemists Arvind Dar in his laboratory and computational chemists Avner Schlesinger in his laboratory. So we have a number of approaches. I'll just show you one. Uh, we've taken an already approved drug, serafinib, and we feed it to flies in, with a thyroid cancer model. About 5% of them live. And then we knock out, one by one, every kinase in the fly kinome, since serafinib is a kinase inhibitor. We identify pro-targets, targets that serafinib would be better at if it would hit those, and anti-targets. These are targets that serafinib already hits, but are problematic. They cause toxicity, or they block its ability to knock the tumor out. And based on those, we have a palette of those, and we do a lot of modeling, and we create what we call serafologs, which are serafinib analogs. And these have really been spectacular, and flies move from 5% to 90% survival. And not only do we see uh, response rates of over two orders of magnitude in, in mammalian models, including PDX models, but these drugs, which are polypharmacological in nature, tend not to induce resistance because they hit so many targets. They're very difficult to find ways around. I can talk more about that later. The other point I want to bring out that we've learned in exploring these issues of therapeutics is the importance of embracing complexity in our models. So let's think about colorectal cancer, which is really a frustrating one. We have very little in the way of targeted therapies. So Erdem Bangi, a postdoc in the lab, modeled a series of complex patients, or uh, complex models, each one matching patients. For example, the most common quadruple combination you'll see in a patient is RAS, P10, ABC, P53. And he built, built this and several other four and five hit models that match patients. And so what did he do with this? So here's an example of a fly gut tumor. Here in green is the fly gut labeled with GFP. The red is a muscle around it. And what you're seeing is the cell has walked out of the gut, hopped on the oxygen-bearing blue uh, trachea, which like our arterials, walks off to distant sites and a subset of them will form secondary tumors and kill the fly. Makes for a great screen. So, Erdem asks a simple question. Why have drugs failed for these colorectal uh, patients? And you can see some of the answer here. In a one-hit fly or a one-hit mouse in uh, collaboration with Owen Sampson, 13 of 16 drugs worked beautifully to knock the tumor out just as published, which was good. But the four hit models, zero of 16 worked, is which, which is what actually happened in clinical trials. In fact, no single drug that we've been able to find can stop a four hit or five hit tumor. You need drug cocktails such as this one, which we're pushing into clinical trials. So again, polypharmacology, hitting many targets, and, and the mechanism of these are extremely unexpected. So empirical screening. So in general, what we've been thinking about in my laboratory and others 
is the importance of thinking about networks, not targets, right? First of all, if you, in precision medicine, the idea is to hit single targets, and that can work sometimes. But you're gonna struggle in, with many patients because first of all, um, when you hit a single target, networks respond to that. If you hit many targets, that is, I just do double precision, and hit two targets, again, it has unpredict unpredictive results, non-predictive results, because networks are very complex within the tumor. But of course, the problem is much more complicated than that. The tumor is only one of thousands of networks in the human. There are other networks, there are liver networks, there are kidney and muscle networks, and what we find is that the best drugs also attack those to help choke the tumor out. But we also have to account for those for toxicity. And then, of course, there's the problem of individual to individual variation. So how are we gonna deal with all this complexity? Well, I'm a fly lab. I know how we're gonna deal with that complexity. We're gonna move to my favorite model, fruit flies. And so what I'm gonna end my talk with is talking about a fly to bedside study where we're trying to embrace complexity and create these therapeutics for these patients in the Center for Personalized Cancer Therapeutics. This is very much a team at net, uh, activity. We have over 30 people that are involved, including oncologists, bioinformaticists, genomics experts, uh, uh, genetic counselors, mouse and fly geneticists, and so on. So it's really been a team effort on this. And this summarizes what we do with the patients. And this study has been open for about a year now. We have about uh, uh, 30 patients, uh, sorry, 20 patients enrolled, and about three uh, per month are, are enrolled. Essentially, the patient comes in, we sequence them, and then we do a high-level analysis to determine which genes are actually affected by these mutations, either within the tumor or germline. And then what we build is what we call a personalized fly avatar, okay? Just for that patient, we'll build up to a 15-hit model to, to capture as many of those mutations as we can. We're focused on colorectal and thyroid tumors. Once we have that avatar, you know what we're gonna do. We put it in our robotics. Now we screen a library of FDA-approved drugs through multiple iterations to create drug cocktails that we can give to the patient. And then um, uh, everything is vetted carefully uh, by a scientific committee. And if the patient then chooses to take that therapy, they are enrolled in the second part of the study. So I'll just finish by talking about an example of one patient, which is some of the things that we've learned. And it seems like each patient we learn something new. This is a patient who has medullary thyroid carcinoma, actually a very young patient, has the classic RET mutation, and in addition, has mutation in four other genes, none of which have been implicated in any sort of cancer. So we made a five-hit model for this patient, and interestingly, this model, like the patient, doesn't respond to any of the RET inhibitors, even though the tumor in our fly model is not uh, more aggressive than RET alone. It no longer responds to those, and in fact, we've recommended therapies that are very surprising, but seem to show efficacy against this particular patient's tumor. Another patient who also has oncogenic RET requires a completely different cocktail, which brings up the question, are we gonna have to make a fly avatar, a different one for every patient on the planet? This is one of the arguments against our approach. And the answer, of course, is I have no idea. I hope we can identify uh, beforehand, in fact, we're working to build large databases of pre-screen, hundreds of models, what we call avatar armies, but time will tell. So in summary, um, we're, we're trying to find ways to embrace the complexity of disease and then work backwards, both in the models themselves, and I think the record in the lab is a 17-hit model, but also in our drugs, which don't attack individual uh, targets very hard, but attack many targets and move networks towards normal. It appears that normal cells, when we do it right, can take those sorts of things, this buffering of the network, but cells that have moved out of that normal space have difficulty handling that, and they have difficulty finding ways around it. And this can also address things like tumor heterogeneity, where our multi-targeting uh, drugs really don't care about the details of the subclone. It sort of runs over the whole network itself. And we think that this also has potential for other diseases, and we've launched into rare genetic diseases and diabetes. And these are diseases where you need to treat the patient for months or years on end. And again, <coughs> taking a node out of a network for months or years may be a very toxic way to go about it in many cases. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you very much.